So I thought we could talk a bit more about, you know, large language models, AI, image stuff. In a previous video, we looked at stable diffusion and image generation using diffusion. And at one point in the video, I basically hand waved off this kind of text embedding text prompt thing. We embed this by using our GPT style transformer embedding and we'd stick that in as well. Right, so the idea is that you've got this model that you've trained to try and produce new images, but you want to be able to write some text that explains what you actually want in the image. And how do we give it that text? How do we say, I want a frog on stilts? Right? How, you know, how do we pass the, the text frog on stilts into a network. What we're trying to do is we're trying to represent an image in the same way that we represent language within a model. Right? That's the idea. And, it's, and we call this process or clip, right? or contrastive language image pairs. So there are lots of times in AI where what we want to do is take an image and represent it in some way that we can talk about it. Right? So when you're talking to you know, one of the more recent chat GPTs or um, Copilot, on, you know, on Windows or whatever, you can put an image in and you can say what's in this image and it will try and explain it to you or you can say what happens in this image when something, you know, and it can, it can kind of reason about these things or at least that's the, the implication of what the text it's producing is. Right? That's, that's for a different day. The question I suppose is how do we turn an image into that kind of language so that we can then talk about it? So one way of doing this is that you could just train up a classifier. So you could say, I've got my ImageNet classification task with a thousand classes, cats, dogs, airplanes, buses, hotels, whatever. And you just train your thousand class classifier on all images. And then if you want text from the image, all you do is you put it into the classifier, it says it's a cat. So you just, you've got the word cat, right? You've solved it. Now, this isn't a particularly effective solution because there are probably more than a thousand things on earth, right? At least I think there are. I haven't listed them. So, if you train your 1,000 class or even 10,000 class classification problem, it's only still going to work on those things you trained it on, and even then it might get it wrong. So it doesn't scale particularly well. Okay? And so every time you want to introduce a new concept, so let's say you want a specific type of cat, or you want a new species of animal that you haven't considered before, you've got to go back to the drawing board, collect a whole new bunch of data, and then train again. So that doesn't really, really work at all. So the next thing you could do is you could say, okay, well, let's try and cut out this, this classifier and just, we'll just predict text, right? So this is quite a common thing to do. So for a long time, captioning was, was essentially the goal of this kind of process. So what you would do, you'd have an image and you have a network or a transformer that's trained to just spit out a sentence that describes that image. And this is quite a popular uh, problem that's been solved in the computer vision literature. So you put an image and you say, this is a man sitting in front of a boat or something like this. This works better in the sense that you can get better text out, right? Instead of just boat or man, you can get this is a man in front of a boat. But it has that same problem of scale. If that man is standing in front of a hotel and you haven't given it any examples of that, maybe it won't work quite so well. So <clears throat> what we haven't really managed to do is any kind of scalable way of pairing images and their meaning to the text that describes them. Right? And that's what a clip embedding does. Right, the idea is that we're going to try and find some kind of embedded numerical space where the images and the text are now in the same place. This is a bit like the word vectoring that we... It's quite a lot like that, except that we've trained the vectors to align both between text and images. Right, so the idea is, imagine some high dimensional numerical space where everything has a fingerprint, but that if you take an image and the text that represents that image, they'd have the same fingerprint. Right? And that way you can go, oh, they're the same thing, you know, or at least that that caption represents this image. So how would we do that? Well, the first thing you need to do is collect an absolutely massive amount of data. Right? So the sort of size, I mean, this, the clip paper that came out, in fact, I've got, I've got a copy of it. So this paper's from 2021. They collected a data set of 400 million image caption pairs, which we can talk about that collection process in a moment. That would be considered quite small by today's standards, right? Today, five billion might be a more reasonable number of images. Now, downloading five billion images is not very easy on your laptop. Right? If, you down, if you get a cluster of servers going, it still might take you a week. Right? It is a monstrously large amount of data, but there is a lot of stuff on the internet. Not all of it good, I should add. Anyway, so the, the policy was basically, go on the internet and try and find images that have captions, right? So either in alt text or sitting nearby on the website or you know, something like this and then try and find captions that have some usable in interesting information. So you don't want like an IS ISBN number for a book, right? That's not very helpful captioning. 
Um, you want a description of what's in the image. Some of the descriptions are going to be very good, like a man in front of a boat wearing a red jumper and all this stuff. Some of them are going to be a dog. And you know, and you sort of you take what you can get right, when you're scraping the internet. Some of them are going to be known classes. Some of them are going to be, should we say, not safe for work classes. Right? Some of them very problematic. And so, but you, unfortunately, there's now so many images, you can't really look through very well and find them. Okay, so, so this you, is mainly still images or all still it's images? It's all still images, right? You could do this on videos, but, but that's a separate piece of work, let's say. Right? So, so you go on your web, you, you, you get a web crawler going, which is a bit like you know, one of the search engine might use, but it's specifically designed to go and try and find images that have captions with useful words in, which you can then download. And now you've got your 400 million images. And what you want to do is train a model of some description that maps those text pairs and those image pairs together. So let's start with a classifier, right? Could we do that? We could have a four million classification problem. Doesn't make any sense, right? That's not gonna work. Um, also, some of the prompts are gonna be similar, but not quite the same. A red cat, a black cat. Well, there isn't red cats, but anyway. I know what you mean, no. But you can't, you can't control what you're going to find on the internet, right? So, Absolutely. But the point is, those are very similar. They're, they're sort of the same class, right? But they're not. So, you know, a class-based system where you're going to try and put things in specific categories isn't really going to work. What we want to do is find a way of embedding this, these places into a sort of numerical score, right? But, but represents them. So here's what we're going to do. For our 4 million image data set, right, or even bigger, We've got a bunch of image and text pairs. So I'm going to represent text as just a line, right? It's, it's actually a numerical encoding of that text because, of course, you can't actually put a string of text into a neural network. You turn it into numbers first, right? So we have an image, and we have an image, and we have an image, and we draw them this way all the way up to image 400 million or something like this. So I'm going to leave some out of my drawing, right? That's and this, quite lazy, actually, personally. I, think you, I mean, I've got there's some more paper here. We, this is why you do this on a computer and not by hand. So what we're going to do is we're going to create two networks. We're going to have the images go into what we call a vision transformer, a vision transformer. And that is a transformer model like we've talked about before, sort of same sort of transformer models you see in things like diffusion or big, large networks. And it's going to put this into this embedded space. So the input is an image with let's say red, green and blue channels, and the output is a numerical vector that says there's this in the image, right? And we don't know what that really means. On the other side, we're gonna have our text string and we're gonna put this through a normal text transformer, similar to the way that you would structure something like ChatGPT, all right? So this is just gonna be text transformer. I don't, know how, well, I don't know what the code for that is, I'm just gonna write T. And what we're gonna try and do is, across this entire data set, train it so that these embed to the same place when they're a pair, and when they're not a pair, they embed to different places, right? Because there are different things in the image. So how do we train this? Well, what we do is we take a batch of images, let's say five images. So let's say our batch or our mini batch is five. Okay? So we're gonna have five images with five bits of text that go with those images. And we're gonna put them through our vision transformer and through our text encoder, right? So we're going to get image, 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 nearly off the page, we made it. Text, 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 text. And I thought briefly about drawing in different images in here, and then I realized that that would look really bad because my cat looks a lot like my dog and my horse. So I'm gonna pretend we've got very nice pictures in there. Now, if we embed this, we're gonna get an embedding for this one, and we're gonna get an embedding for this one. It's gonna be some feature vector. We, we don't know what it means. And what we're going to do is we're going to calculate the distance between the embedding of this and the embedding of this. Let's just call that a distance D. And we're gonna have a distance between these ones, we're gonna have another distance here, another distance here, another distance here, we're gonna have a distance between this one and this one. That's gonna be a different distance. My notation's all off, so let's call this D1, D2, or whatever, right? It doesn't really matter. It's a big matrix of, of distances, all right? D3, D4, D5. Now, what we've done is we've set this up in a way where this is the first pair, and this is the second pair, and this is the third pair. So the good stuff that we want, the embeddings that we want to be the same, are on the diagonal, right? All the other embeddings, we're going to say that we want to dissuade you from, from coming up with a similar embedding in a similar image. So what we do when we train it is we take our entire batch, we calculate all of the embeddings for all of the different uh, images and text, and then we calculate the distance between each embedding, and we're going to maximize the distances on the diagonal, and for the sake of nice colors, minimize all the other distances in the matrix. 
And we're going to do that over and over again for 400 million images. We're going to train this VIT, and we're going to train this T to encode these things so that they meet in the middle like this. Or if they're a different image, so if it's a picture of a cat, but the text says a man in front of a boat, it doesn't embed them into the same place. It embeds them into very different places. Now, the metric we use for this is something called cosine similarity. You could use different metrics. Cosine similarity is best, easiest to think of it as the angle between two numbers, right? So let's imagine that you have a two-dimensional, uh, to show a quick one, let's imagine your feature embedding is only two, right? So you have two things. This is a bit like when we did Face ID, right? We're talking about phones. Oh, when you can unlock your face with a phone. That's the one. If you want to unlock a face with your phone, right? You have an embedding over here, you have an embedding over here, and this is the angle between them. If you have a different embedding over here, that's a bigger angle. And so these are more similar than these two. And cosine similarity just measures this angle, but in a higher dimensional space. It's like an angle of vectors. So it's an angle of a vector in like a 256 or a thousand element space. So this works really, really well. We actually, we're not training the images. We're not training this matrix. We're using this matrix to train this encoder and this encoder here. Right? So they're taking images, putting it in an embedded space, taking text, putting it in an embedded space. Okay? And so then the question is, well, okay, we've done that, right? Let's say we've done it over 400 million images. Right? Now what do we do with this? Well, the point now is that you've got a way of representing the meaning or the content of a photo in the same way as you can represent captions of that photo or captions of a different string. So now let's imagine you were trained, let's just show a couple of examples of the sort of things you could do. Right? Clip gets used in a lot of places, right, for a lot of what we call downstream tasks. So the downstream tasks are how you use a clip once it's trained. So let's imagine you've got your diffusion model, which is trying to produce a lovely image of something that you, you've written in your prompt. So you have your Gaussian noise, and you have your de denoising process, which is trying to produce a nice new lovely image of a, of a person. Mouth, ears, right, hair. There we go, I've, I've stopped now. Now, but we want to put some text in to say we want a picture of a person instead of a, a picture of a frog or something like this. So in, in here, what we do is we take a man, a man in front of a boat, which I'm now going to have to draw in. So there we go, right? And we put that in, we embed it using the text encoding that we've just created using our clip training. So this turns this into a big set of numbers, let's say 0, 0.1, minus 0.5, all the way along, right? It's a very large list of numbers, but doesn't literally say a man in front of a boat. It just embeds the kind of meaning of that sentence in the same way you could embed an image of a man in front of a boat. And then what you do is you insert this into the network during the training process to say, that's the guidance I want to give you. But when I skipped over this in the stable diffusion video, that's what it's doing. It's taking a, a pre-trained clip encoder, encoding the text to guide the generation of the image. Let's think of a different pro problem. So one of the nice things about Clip, or one of the things that the advocates for Clip would say was a really positive application of it, is what we call zero shot classification, for example. So zero shot means you're classifying images despite never ever having been asked or trained to classify an image. So how would you do that? Well, it's a bit weird, right? Because if you think about, you've got something that will embed an image right, into our embedded space, and you've got something that will embed text into our embedded space, but you can't undo that process. It doesn't work in reverse. So that means we can't take a text string, embed it, and then unembed it into the image. You can only go this direction, right? This, this direction here and this direction here. So let's imagine I wanted to find out what was in an image, but I didn't want to bother using this classifier training program that I'd come up with. I want to use Clip to do this, right? They've, been, they've trained on 400 million images. It's got to see a cat before. I should be able to classify cats, right, if I want to. So what do we do? So it's slightly odd. What we do is we first embed a bunch of strings that say the image contains a cat, right? So we say, we have a string that says a photo of a cat. Now, of course, it might not be a cat, right? So we also have a photo of a dog. And we keep this going for all the different classes that we have, all the way down to a photo of a bus, right? Those are the three things I can think of. But you actually have to write the, physically write the sentence out and then embed it using this into your embedded space. So you embed this, you embed this, you embed this, and these are essentially your lookups, right? These are the embedded representation of that sentence. 
And what we're doing is we're trying to find which of these is closest to the embedded representation of this image. So we take the image that we're trying to classify, which has got a picture of a cat in it. How do you, how do you draw a cat? <laughs> sort of rabbity, catty thing, right? You embed this into this into this cat embedding, right? This is our sort of this is our kind of test embedding. And now we have to see which of these is closest to it. We measure that cosine distance and we can say, well, okay, actually it's closest to the, the sentence, a photo of a cat. So what we haven't done is explicitly say this picture is of a cat. We've said that if you embed this picture using our clip embeddings, and you also embed the phrase a photo of a cat, those things are quite similar, which implies that it is a picture of a cat. Right? Now, that is not foolproof in any sense. And also, if you're thinking that all seems very inefficient, right? couldn't you just train a classifier? Yes. Right? For some problems, I think training a classifier is by far the easiest way of doing this. But this gives you this kind of scalable way of doing it where you don't actually have to explicitly tell it what to do. You can hope it comes out in the wash later. Before, when you said, oh, we inject this into the stable diffusion, yeah. does the diffusion have to have seen the embeddings? How does it know? How are you talking in the same space? Okay, yeah. Well, it gets learned during the process. So the idea would be that, suppose you're doing the training rather than the, the inference. Right? You're not producing new images, you're training. You take an image of a cat, right? Again, I'm going to have to, right? And... It needs the whiskers, I'm sorry, but that's the cat now. Oh, it's not a good one though, is it? <laughs> now, you have a you know, picture of a cat, right? And, and this is your training pair. So you no longer have just an image that you're trying to construct. So what you do is you add some amount of noise to it and you train your network to say, this was the noise I added or this was the reconstructed image, right? So this is a clean image of a cat which is now different, but close enough. But you also give it this text. So what you're saying is, you're, you're learning that given an image that looks like a noisy cat, and the text that it's meant to be a picture of a cat, give me a clean image of a cat, right? And over time, it learns to do this in a general case, and it learns to do it where you can put different text in here. Right? That's the idea. But you have to do this during training, because if you didn't ever give it this text during training, there'd be no way to tie the two concepts together. So this network learns this over time. Um, a lot of this, it requires massive, massive scale. If you want to get really good images with really nice nuanced text prompts, you have to have a lot of examples. Because if you just have a few dozen cats, it's going to be very poor and it's not going to properly reflect what you... You could say a picture of a cat, but you couldn't say a picture of a cat wearing this and in, in, in this place. And, it, and it's not very powerful. So things like Stable Diffusion and Dali have been trained over massive image and text sets specifically so that they have this generalizable property, or at least they are somewhat more generalizable than they would otherwise be. Eventually, the network is going to start to learn how to... I mean, actually, that's not right, because Dave's far away from Dave, right? So hopefully, we start to come together. So if right? we just sort of feel our way towards it by taking off little bits of noise at a time, we can actually produce an image. Right? So you start off with a noisy image,